Welcome to Wall Street Jack Boys Game Plan Sunday. Today is June 2nd, 2019, and we're here with another game plan session strategy session. As we always do every week, we're going to take a look at what occurred over the past week. Uh, what do we have in the pipeline and, you know, uh, set our focus to how we're going to generate some income and make some money for the weeks to come, uh, you know, before us. And we got a lot to cover here. Uh, it's a lot that's been going on. And, uh, you know, we'll do a small little session at the end uh, where we'll actually do a little review here on our new blog that we just actually uh, went over. So, but let's just get into the juicy stuff right off the bat. All right. So, all right, I see you guys. What's up? So basically, uh, last week was a super bearish week. Um, had a lot of downturn in the markets. Uh, the Dow Jones is down, you know, for the sixth, you know, consecutive week, which has been its, like its longest stint on a downturn for like since like 2011, I want to say. So it's a really not a good signal, not a good signal when the markets is going down. We had a short week because Monday was the uh, the holiday, so everybody had pretty good, you know, Memorial Day holiday. And then the markets opened up straight off the bat in red. And uh, a lot of it came from the yield curve, which I'm showing you guys right here on the screen. Our handy dandy Wall Street Jack Boys yield curve that I man and manage is right here. And anyhow, you guys can check that out and you can interact with it and do whatever you want to do with it, whatever studies you got here. But this is a very, very cool indicator. And it lets you know about the uh, health of the economy. Okay. So, um, but yeah, Tuesday was, you know, the markets was just selling off and um, Wednesday was a continuation and Thursday we had like a small little rally, you know, the markets was like holding, it was like the plunge protection coming in. And then, you know, Thursday was just, you know, I guess at, you know, at the end of the day, Trump started spazzing on Mexico and, <laughs> and then the markets went, you know, went back down the drain. And so, um, but that was what occurred over the past week, right? And so what we had to look forward to uh, coming out of that situation is basically the situation with, uh, first First of all, we got the situation with China. As y'all know, the trade situation with China still hasn't gone through. Uh, the 25% tariff increase on those goods, that's still over our heads. Marcus is not feeling that. And then on top of it, we got this new development with Mexico where Trump is like, hey, you guys need to fix this border situation. We'll stop this immigration stuff. Or I'm going to, you know, tax you all 5%. Um, and it's going to be a, a multiplier. It's going to continue to grow every month until they actually fix it. So he's basically using tariffs as a tool. Uh, uh, basically, you know, that's the way countries use tariffs anyway, uh, you know, for punishment or whatever behavior they're trying to curb. Um, they slap tariffs on those things. And that's basically what he's doing right now. Um, Mark is not feeling it because there's a lot of companies that got lots of exposure in Mexico. And so, you know, Mexico, uh, in fact, we just had the U.S. Mexico Canada deal that, you know, Trump and them has, you know, drafted and that's got to get passed with Congress. I want to say, I believe next month. So we got that to look forward to, but I don't even know how that's supposed to even go through with them beefing like this. And uh, it makes it interesting because again, a lot of our goods come from Mexico and, um, you know, those 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 goods, those costs, those tariffs, they get passed back on to consumers They get passed on to you and I. We have to pay for those things, basically. So that means your money gets shorter and shorter for things that you normally would buy. They're going to cost you more money. And I think that one of the questions that I have here is with Trump slapping the taxes on uh, the tariffs on Mexico now, will that escalate? Will you know, will Mexico retaliate? Our car industry is heavily, you know, exposed in uh, Mexico. We have foods. We have uh, lots of medical uh, technology and things like that that's down in Mexico. And so uh, Mexico, you know, they could retaliate. So that's, you know, something that's interesting that, you know, if we hear anything about Mexico retaliating, the markets is not going to be feeling that coming up uh, this week. And so you still got that to look forward to. Um, we also had developments with uh, um um, Huawei. So the, the Chinese company Huawei, that's still a situation where, you know, the U.S. basically banned them. And so China's been trying to retaliate and try to say, you know, basically uh, America, y'all are, you know, uh, wrongfully doing our company, basically. And uh, it's not, you know, uh, rooted in anything technical. It's, it's, a, it's a bias, basically, and it's unfair. And so uh, they're trying to launch their own retaliation efforts 
for American companies, right? Because Huawei made a lot of things for, you know, a lot of these American companies as well. So I know on the forefront, Microsoft was there. It's a lot of questions about what well, Microsoft are going to, you know, impose a ban on them as well. So it's pretty much, you know, when it comes to this whole 5G situation, the government, everybody is involved. They don't want China in on it. You know, China's leading the technology, but America got to win this race just like it was like the space uh, space wars and everything else. So anyhow, that is still a development. And um, but the biggest issue that we had that we've been keeping up with all week has been the yield curve. So let me actually show you guys our handy dandy yield curve right here real quick. And, you know, I don't know what nobody else is doing in the markets, but this is something that I created here and we stay on it in our group. So it helps us with uh, navigating the markets, give us a sense of direction. So anyhow, uh, as you guys already know, this yield curve situation, what we're actually monitoring here is this three months and 10 years. So short term versus long term. If it's two different views, this bottom view show you this three months yields. And this one shows you the 10 year yields, which is long term. So short term, long term. I just put an S there, short term, long term. And anyhow, anytime. And here you go again. This is the three months. And then this here is the 10, 10 year. These lines are not supposed to be touching each other. OK, anytime they cross, that's an inversion. OK, and when these things invert, there is a recession that follows. So it's a technical reason why we say there's a recession coming because we see it here. And I can go way back. I got over like 30 years of data here and I can show you clearly on the maps, but we're not going to go through it right now. But every time this crosses, a recession follows within the, the, the following two years uh, at the most. So there should be one coming. All right. Um, but this is why the market has been selling off is because the bond market is telling us, uh, you know, the uh, economy is slowing down. Right. And so if you loan your money, thanks. You, thank you, Mark. Yeah. If you loan your money to the government, basically for 10 years, you're going to get back 2.14 yield. Whereas if you give it to them for three months, you're going to make more yield. That's not the way that it's supposed to be. Longer term means greater danger. It's uh, it's higher risk. So you're supposed to make more money the higher risk you take on. OK, so anyhow, we got a whole class. Once you join, become a member of Wall Street Jack Boys. We got a whole two hour course to give you the whole economic breakdown, how to use this stuff. So definitely uh, check us out. Wall Street Jack Boys dot com and subscribe so you can get, you know, one of the many courses that we have. But anyhow, this is what's been occurring over the past week. The focus on these yields have been continuing to go down. OK. And uh, the short term has been slightly up and the long term has continued to go down. So that's the inversion because this is this is shorter. So you get 2.14 versus 2.35. The next one is going to be this 20 year and then the 30 year. These here, these are the ones that they're also waiting to, to come down as well. OK, so these are starting to come down if the economy or if the, excuse me, if the markets continue to not like what's happening, then you're going to see more of this go down. OK. And the next line that we're going to watch here is going to be this two year, which is at one point nine five and the 10 year. OK. So once this right here inverts, like right now, everybody's trying to, you know, keep everybody, you know, crowd control. Hey, be quiet, everybody. Don't Tell everybody, you know, but all the financial managers out there, all the big wigs, they know what's going on. There is no getting out of this. It don't matter who you are. Again, I told you every time this crosses, there's a recession that follows. OK, there's always a recession that follows when this, and this is the most accurate indicator of a recession. So what I'm telling people, there's a recession coming. It's not just because I'm pulling you know, something out my ass. It's because this, the system, the data is telling us there's a recession that's going to be coming. OK. So pay attention. All right. Um, also, uh, the next thing when you start, when you guys probably start hearing the financial wigs start to talk about it would be when this curve, which is the two year inverts over the 10 years. So the pressure on this one here continues. If that falls beneath this one, when that falls beneath this one, that's when you're going to hear all the financial gurus start panicking and everything. But we're already seeing their reaction in the markets right now. We're starting to see the flight to safety here. So anyhow, uh, if you guys want to take a, uh, a look at that tool, it's on our website, uh, washyjackboys.com slash treasury yield curve. You could use it. OK, uh, just go to the website and check that out. All right. So also a uh, new article that we just released this uh, week was called Income and Wealth Inequality is Fair. 
but is it healthy or harmful? Make sure you guys check this out, and I definitely would like to hear your reviews on it. This is a it's a, it's a very interesting uh, piece of work here, and and if you think about the economic cycle where we are in the cycle right now with the end of the bull market, and we already have signals of a recession that's coming. Um, you know, in the near future within the next two years. So this is something that, you know, I want to, you know, get some feedback from you guys on. I want to know what your thoughts are. There are no right or wrong answers. But, uh, you know, probably at the end of the session here, we'll probably go through it. But let me get into our money making deal, what we do. OK, bingo. Here we go. Right now, the market is live. I was watching the uh, the futures at six o'clock. As soon as the market's open, it was down 35 percent. The Nasdaq was OK. Let me. uh Pull out my uh, tools here. All right. So again, Marcus is trading live right now. They already read and uh, down 45 points uh, right now. So we already got a taste of what tomorrow is going to look like. It looked like um, the sell offs are going to continue. All right. Uh, if we're looking at the ES right now, which is the S and P 500, you can look at this and call it a maybe a long-term double tops okay i'm gonna just draw this so you can see it and again if you guys you know all the members you guys got the books that we created with the patterns and all this other stuff so you can identify this but this pattern you can just like look at it and you can see what the pattern is and the good thing about patterns and one of the things that we do in the stock market is that we recognize patterns because you can predict patterns you know um you know look like a duck quack like a duck smell like a duck it's probably a duck right so you know we approach the market in the same way anyhow this here you know you can say this is you know the double top right here and this is a bullish uh, excuse me a bearish pattern uh, once it hits this top here then it breaks and you know that's the predictive the, the predicted path is that is you know to be further down and so that's what we're seeing here I'm seeing that top and this top this is long term. This is, you know, lots, lots of months here. Uh, but that's the pattern that we're looking at. OK, we had one back here in between it. OK, we had one here. This was the December sell offs. And so it's like a, a double top within a double top. OK, because then you got this one coming in right on top of that. All right. Cool. So um, being that that's the case on a technical perspective, uh, we do have some levels here that I just want to pay attention to real quick. Um, so this was the deal. This was the deal on the ES. Okay. On the S and P 500, this was the 100 moving average. We saw it, you know, hit the top roll over. It held at the 100, uh, as a support level and it came back up and it tested the 20 moving average here. And then it came back down, traded sideways back at that floor. And then it broke. This was last week, came to the 200. Um, uh, I told you guys last week, we're going to watch the 200 and we'll see how it's going to hold up. Right. And we saw it fall. So it fell. It's falling through the floor. Now, the Dow Jones and everything else is pretty much already through it. Um, this right here is coming down now. And I'm eyeing a level about 2,700. You see here as the next floor. Okay. So I'm eyeing that level here as the next floor level where you can get, you know, we should get some support zones and, um, you know, place some things to the long side. Okay. Um, but that's the, uh, the big view, the big macro view, um, this week, you know, again, with all the downturn, uh, gold has been the move and gold is still the move. Gold futures here. <clears throat> What's good, everybody. I see y'all on the Facebook side. Thank you for chiming in. All right, cool. So yeah, gold has been the move um this past week it's interesting as you guys see here i got a little scan tool uh here <laughs> you can see this right here this this is like a little gold list that i have so if you guys are interested in playing some gold stocks you know these these are the, this is where you want to look to okay these these names here <laughs> these are your gold names so you want some exposure in gold that's where you want to be now gold it's been a very interesting case here because last year we had, uh, let's see, last year I had a client of mine who actually called me and said he's going to go buy some gold in uh, California. And I asked him, why are you going to go buy gold? He said, he don't know. He said, I don't know. 
I'm just going to buy some gold, man, because somebody told me to buy some gold. I'm like, hmm, somebody just told you to go buy gold. Let me go look at those charts. <laughs> and so anyhow, this is like in September time frame. And I saw those floors printed in there. And then I saw us coming up off those floors and get that buy trigger. So last year was a gold was a, a nice move for us uh, as well, because as you see, gold has rallied, you know, from that point all the way up there. And that's crazy because it was in a bearish territory, but now it's in a bullish territory and it's holding its levels very strong. This yellow line is a 200 moving average. As long as we stays above that, this is bullish. All right. And anyhow, so here we go again. Gold is back in the zone. Uh, we got the, the buy trigger that was there right here. OK, um, you can just say this is the floor level is it's held. It actually looks like a double bottom, which is the reverse of a double top. Double tops look like M's, double bottoms look like W's. All right. And that's a bullish pattern. All right. So we see the technical setup and uh, we got the story. The story is the trade wars uh, tariff um, and all this volatility that's coming in the markets. OK, that's the story that backs what we're seeing in the technicals. And um, so anyhow, uh, gold is still the play. Uh, GLD is, you know, again, we guys trading options. Uh, GLD is where you want to be. Okay, so we'll put that in there. All right, so this is where you want to get your move off in right here, GLD. And let me actually get us some new FIB levels. Um, we can keep that in there as the floors. But what I want to do is uh, let's take from this high here to this low. We go to this low. All right. And then we'll just remove these out the way. And we'll keep this down here as a floor level. And so we have, uh, we want to see it clear here. This would be the next level, but 125 is where we're trying to go at it to the immediate term. All right, so we got the buy triggers in here. Everything is looking bullish on here. Okay, momentum is bullish. The trend is bullish. We don't have a squeeze, so we you can't count that one, but we don't necessarily need to squeeze. Okay, we got everything else in the play. And so I would say to 125 should be the next target. And then 129, 130 will be, you know, the uh, key target that we're, you know, that gold is trying to get to. And it doesn't mean that I'm necessarily wanting it to get there, but the way that the, the markets is playing out, um, that's definitely uh, something that could happen. Um, so, again, it's not that I want a recession to happen or anything crazy. And it's not going to be a recession that's going to come like tomorrow or a month from now, two months from now. This is going to take some time for it to develop. Um, as the feds, you know, do what they need to do or attempt to do what they need to do. In fact, all eyes in the markets are going to be based off of the feds reaction to all of this development and the markets want the feds to drop those interest rates. And so that's when we see, see these panics in here. So, um, if we go back to, let me, uh, take that out. Yeah. If we actually go back to our charts in here if I can get them up okay there we go all right so if we actually go back let me just uh, go back to the S&P 500 yeah so if we go back to the, uh, the S&P 500 here we can see that uh, when the when the uh, feds raised the interest rates last time all right Fed say, hey, we're going to raise them up here. The markets was not having it, okay? The markets had a fit super oversold, okay? Like that was just crazy sell-off move. And now we had a, another situation where uh, now the um, the markets, they're looking for the Feds to cut the interest rates. And so we'll be paying attention and keeping our ears to the streets for the Feds to see what Powell is going to say if they're going to move off of, you know, the market's going down right now. OK, the the bonds, the yield curves are inverted. You know, uh, as more panic comes in, we should see more sell offs. Will the feds react to that? That's going to be the uh, question for the next couple of weeks. And it's going to be interesting. I don't really know if the feds are going to react. I don't think they're going to react 
I think they're going to try to play hardball, but they're going to have to do something eventually. So, you know, either cut the cut the interest rates is what the market is is hoping. Right. Because the cost of doing business is cheaper when they bring those interest rates down. All right. And um, so we got a lot of things going on right now. So we will keep our ears open to the Fed's talk to see. And I think they have some some meetings coming up here in the next week or so. So we'll be listening to that. And basically, if they don't say anything about cutting the interest rates, then the market is probably going to do that again. OK, because that's what the markets want. The markets want them to cut those interest rates. And so anyhow, I'm thinking that basically they probably play hardball. But we already know, looking at the Fed watch tool, we uh, the financial wigs are already pricing in uh, rate cut in September. So September is the key date that everybody's focusing on for the Fed to cut those rates. And if you guys uh, take a look, September is like three months from now. So um, anyhow, that's what we have for that. Uh, let's just take a look here at the bonds because the bonds tell us the truth. The bonds, as you see, super, super hot, best performer. <laughs> best performer right now of the year is the bond market. That's crazy, yo. Bonds is like, shee. Look at that. Almost looking like Bitcoin here. <laughs> but yeah, so basically, uh, bonds hitting new highs, man. And even on my Fibonacci levels, they've already exceeded those things. And I don't know if they're ready to take a breather right now. I mean, they should be taking a breather, but I'm not too sure. If we're looking at the markets right now, you know, bonds, you know, bonds are up. The markets are down. So you may see this thing continue to push up a little more, um, you know, but, you know, I, I what I expect for it to do would be, you know, like it does in the past here. It rallies up and hits that peak, comes back to the mean, hit the next new highs, come back to the mean, and here we go again, right? And so I would expect that the bond should try to take a breather and then come back down to these levels or maybe these levels as the next support level, you know, before it makes its next uh, rally up. So anyhow, <clears throat> um, interesting thing is that uh, normally bonds, gold, and utilities, they move together because these are flights to safety. Utilities haven't participated in this rally. It's interesting. But then the week before, gold wasn't um, uh, participating either. Gold is just now coming on. So um, as we start to see some of these sectors that normally correlate kind of unravel, it makes it a little more difficult to kind of predict them because it's like, uh, well, they normally go together. But right now they're kind of diverging. And so it's interesting. We're seeing, uh, you know, bonds has been doing its thing. And then we see gold is uh coming out now so anyhow tlt still in focus <clears throat> if you already hit your targets in tlt which again 50 percent you know profit you know look to take profits right now that's what i have to say i'll uh, tell you on that um and as far as looking uh for some plays here this week i'm looking at i'm looking at uh, a short play in uh defense I'm looking at a short play here in defense, and it looks like it's kind of lagging a double top here. Um, if we, if you see here, let me uh, pull up. This was a top here, and here's another top, and we see it chopping, and it's having issues with getting through that. Can't get through this chopping around, and then we had a sell trigger here. We do have a squeeze right here. The trend is negative. We do have sell triggers here. We see the momentum going down. And so uh, the combination of a double top pattern and then we also have a short squeeze in play. I'm looking at uh, defense sector to short, um, you know, that that's the double top uh, setup that that looked like it's uh, taking place here. OK, so anyhow, um, I like to play that, you know, south and uh, should see that come probably to the 100 or maybe even the 200. It just depends. Just depends, but 200 would be ideal for you know our shorts. So <laughs> yeah, we definitely uh, want to see that happen. Um, so yeah, I'm looking at that as uh, for shorts. Uh, another thing here um, for some long some long exposure is uh, this company in particular, Paycom. 
I do like this one to the long side. Um, I don't really have much on my list looking long so far, but I do have this one here and it did show up in my other list. Uh, this is a good company as far as their financials and everything. So uh, the fundamentals look great on this company and they haven't done much sell off. You know, they're still holding their, you know, the moving averages and uh, with all the uh, downturn, you know, they've been steady, you know, you see them steady and looks like we should come up to these next levels here. So I like this one here. I do have a up uh, a buy trigger here. I got some upwards in the momentum. I do have another squeeze here. Now we don't have our trend participating. That doesn't mean that we need it. We have one, two, three, uh, four indicators uh, to the north side. So I do like this one to the long side. Um, and another interesting development here. I don't know if you guys have been keeping up with the uh, the, the news here, but there was a uh, uh, Verizon had a big sell off big sell off and you guys can see those double top patterns on printing all throughout the market that's double top in there it looks like that m okay so we got the technical setups but then you got to get the story to make it make sense right so we see the technical setup um we saw it right here when it tested and it did not get to clear it and then it started coming down here and so we knew it was weak right there so anyhow when you said you saw the technical setup but then the story is with the catalyst that drives the whole play into motion. So then you get that there. The story behind this one is that Amazon is coming into the wireless market. So if y'all know anything about Amazon, man, Amazon is the disruptor of all disruptors. When Amazon come in your world, you might as well just lay it down because you know, they're really going to crush you probably. Um, you know, Amazon has a lot of capital. They have a lot of smarts. They got the cloud technology and cloud is taking us to wherever we need to be in the future. And Amazon is the leader in that. So, um, you know, kind of interesting to see uh, if Amazon does come into the wireless sector, uh, the wireless industry, um, what kind of impact it would have. Um, and it's a story behind it too. Again, I like stories because the stories kind of make things make sense. So uh, the story behind this situation is that basically um, T-Mobile and Sprint, they've been trying to get this merger and they haven't been able to get approved by the regulators. So with Sprint and T-Mobile not being able to get approved by the regulators because the, um, um, the, um, the fear of competition going down where we only have three major wireless carriers, um, where that's basically the reason why they haven't been able to get approved because it'll reduce the four big uh four giants that we have now it'll get reduced down to three regulators don't want that to happen but they've been talking about amazon is actually and this is the rumor okay amazon is looking to uh come into the industry buy out the boost mobile side of sprint and actually you know come into the wireless uh industry where they can bundle all kind of things for their wireless you know subscribers and you know Amazon has a huge subscriber base, and anyhow, that means that the big boy, which is Verizon, uh, you know, uh, would have some kind of disruption there. We're talking about poaching from their subscribers, because if Amazon comes in and they have the ability and the smarts to drive down rates, drive down prices, you already know I'm a Verizon user. Verizon is not the cheapest, but they're probably going to have to come down cheaper, which will reduce their profits, which will reduce what they bring back to their shareholders, which will bring the stock price down and everything. So anyhow, you see, you know, the action come from the outcome of the uh, the news afterwards. So I uh, don't know if you guys saw that or not, but that's something interesting. that I want to keep my eyes on. Uh, with that being said, I think I pretty much covered everything that I need to cover here. Um, if you guys got anything that y'all want to take a look at, we'll take a look at those real quick and um We'll take a look at the article here and then we'll you know bring it to a close in here. Anybody got any uh, plays, any stocks you guys want to look at? Any questions? Any Q&A? Floor is yours. Give you five minutes, no response, then we'll keep it moving forward. All right. So let's see. While you guys are conjuring up 
plays that you want to look at or questions that you may have about the markets, I'll tell you guys about my article and I hope you guys read it. I hope you guys share it. Hit that share button. OK, this is on the website. OK, income and wealth inequality is fair, but is it healthy or harmful? I like that title because I kind of wanted to change the dynamics of the argument itself so that we can all see it from a different perspective. I think that there's no question about, you know, is capitalism, you know, the right system. Uh, but there's levels to this. And so I want to get into those levels and all those levels. I see them from the perspective or the lens of healthy or harmful. OK, so anyhow, let's get to it. So um, let's see here. All right. So this is what I had here. So we started out with the rich are getting richer and the middle class is on thin ice. The top 10 percent own 70 percent of all U.S. wealth. Studies from the Fed show that the top percenters have not grown their wealth by cutting liabilities, but by simply owning and controlling more assets. Real estate and stocks are the top asset classes that have widened the wealth gap to these extremes. Is wealth and income inequality found in capitalistic societies fair? Everyone has a chance to chase the American dream and create the life they want because we live in a free enterprise capitalist society. Income and wealth inequality is technically fair, but is it healthy or harmful? So that's where we start out with that. And you guys can click on these links. A lot of research went in here, but you guys can check it out if you're into the nerd stuff. But basically, the feds have shown that the reason why the wealth gap has been going up is because of the asset classes. The assets has been bought up by the wealthy, basically, during the uh, 2008 housing cra uh, crisis, uh, the Great Recession, as we call it. Um, a lot of the people, uh, a lot of the middle class was injured, basically, in that. And the, the people who had enough cushion to weather that storm had cash to take all the things that you lost. So people lost houses, people lost business, whatever it is that you lost. You know, the, the, the money guys were basically unaffected because they can acquire those things and they held on to them for you know, all these years and they're still holding on to them. And as you can see, those things have ba bounced back. The market is over 300 percent and everything else. So anyhow, that's the intro to it. Um, I'll get, get into this one here for you. The second paragraph says that while playing a game of Monopoly with my daughter on the Xbox One X the other day, it got me thinking about the economy. Although I won the game, it was full of trials and it took about three hours to complete. I had many setbacks from paying fees, not being able to collect while others were and going to jail, which reminds me of the trials that some of us face today. The game changer happened when one player didn't have enough money to pay the fees for landing on my property. He had to file bankruptcy, which transferred all his money and properties into my possession. The redistribution of wealth pushed me into uh, pushed me to victory while the rest lost. Now, I did exploit the system several times to transfer money to my daughter, but her lack of assets ultimately caused her bankruptcy. The key to winning Monopoly is owning the most assets. I've played Monopoly for many years and have just recently learned this blueprint to winning. The same is true for real life. Anyhow, I wanted to share that in there because, uh, yeah, me and my daughter, we do play Monopoly. And I told you guys several times in the past, play Monopoly with the kids so they can learn how the economy works. Uh, Monopoly is a great teacher uh, because it tells you how it shows you how the economy works from a perspective of a game. And so, as you see here. I discovered that the key to winning Monopoly is only the most assets. And so we saw early in the first paragraph that that's how the wealth gap continues is because, you know, the top, they acquired the most assets. It wasn't for them cutting liabilities. OK, it wasn't them for them cutting expenses. It's just for them buying more, you know, uh, assets. And those assets are stocks and real estate, basically. OK, so anyhow. Next paragraph, as a student of the financial markets and economic cycles, I have noticed that we are at the top of this bull cycle. And when the bubble bursts, there will be many that will be negatively impacted. However, there will be some that will be virtually unaffected. The top 10 percent wealth gaps widen and bubbles. And that's a part of the normal economic cycle. The capitalism is a system that rewards and punishes based on behaviors, much like in grade school. For example, if you study more than the rest and complete all of your assignments and show up every day, then you will earn your A. Contrastly, the class clown that skips class, does not study and stays in detention will ultimately earn their F. That's grade school. OK, you put in your work. You're supposed to get your rewards. Right. That's the way capitalism is uh, supposed to work. But in a socialist society, everyone gets a C. No matter the efforts, everyone is equal. But how is that fair? Hmm. So I pose you guys that question. Right. How is it fair if I go and I bust my butt and I get a C and then the other guy who's a class clown, he doesn't do anything, but he gets a C. That makes it equal, but is it fair? Okay, I want you to, you know, think about that. How is that fair? It's not. 
Why should I be punished when I outwork the rest? That's why I believe capitalism is a fair system because you can literally go from rags to riches. People do this every day, y'all. Rags to riches every day. There are over 10.2 million households with over $1 million, uh, $1 million of network in the U.S. We see people flocking to this nation every day to get their piece of the pie. As long as opportunity exists, then everyone can achieve their dreams. But the system is not designed for everyone to win. There has to be winners and losers. The fact that there are prize trophy winners, the top 10 percent, encourages those at the bottom to work smarter and harder with the hopes that they, too, will one day get to the top. All right. Next paragraph. Companies typically make a spectacle of top performers with the hope that everyone else will strive to be like them. This inequality promotes productivity and competitiveness, which drives smart, hard workers from the grasp of poverty while pushing the economy forward. Most people aspire to be at the top. But the reality is that many will never make it because building wealth is more complicated than just working hard and following the rules. So that's an interesting uh, couple of paragraphs there. But it's basically I'm just going over telling you guys how the system works and basically, you know, living in uh, the society that we are. In. And now everybody, as long as opportunity, that factor, that variable opportunity, as long as it's opportunity that's available, then you can go from rags to riches. I mean, that's the way it is in a game. Everybody can't win, though. There's got to be some losers, got to be some winners. This is the way games work. Everybody's not built the same. Everybody's drive is not the same. One of the issues that I normally have with trying to mentor some people is everybody's drives are not the same. You get the most out of the people who got the biggest drive and those people who don't have drive, they just don't make it far. Right. And so anyhow, we talk about that, but you can see this in your daily life with your companies that you work for, whatever what have you. You have people that are the top agents, the top this, that, and the third, and the company would definitely sprinkle them in your face to say, hey, blase blah hit this bonus, blase blah did this, that, and the third, so you could do it too, right? And that's just the way it works. It's, uh, they figured out that basically having the spectacles uh, who basically make more than you or make more than everybody else, that's inequality. But because, of, because the inequality exists, it drives productivity because everybody wants to also be there. Everybody wants to have the same amount of money that Floyd Mayweather has so you can buy a couple of Maybachs, right? Um, the fact is that everybody doesn't have it. and uh, But as long as there are spectacles, people will always strive to get there, right? And so that creates productivity. So anyhow, that's what that paragraph was talking about. Um, and also talking about how building wealth is actually, I ended it with building wealth is more complicated than just working hard and following the rules. And it is. And so, um, again, these are conversation pieces that I want to have with you guys. I want you guys to share your uh, your thoughts on there. There's no right or wrong answers. Um, it's just a you know conversation starter here. Make sure you guys share the article as well. So I said that one of the main problems is that most of us don't understand how capitalism works and how to leverage the rules of this game to our advantage. Even worse, what if by the time you learn the rules of the game, the system evolved into a system where those rules are no longer applicable? This is a likely future due to current business practices and can result in negative impacts on the economy and society as a whole. I believe that capitalism varies in degrees of healthiness to harmfulness. The goal should be to maintain healthy capitalism so that it works for the benefit of everyone. So, again, I put in my opinion here. This is not fact or fiction or right or wrong. This is my opinion. OK, and um, this opinion is shared amongst, you know, some of the, the most prolific minds you could think of. Uh, I've done a lot of research on the situation. And, you know, again, I'm a student of the markets. We're in the markets every day. This is what I do. OK. Um, and I can recognize when things are good and when things are bad. And so when we talk about a healthy capitalist society, it works for the benefit of everyone. But when the benefit, when everyone and it's not necessarily everyone, but just the majority. And we're really talking about the middle class when that is not uh, on a healthy level. And those people start to fall into the poverty zones, poverty levels, then you have an issue. OK, uh, when the middle class deteriorates, then you have a big problem on your hands because those people will typically re revolt. And then you have, you know, all kind of disruption all over the place. And you start to see it. Now you can hear it. You can hear it echo through this political cycle that we're in now. Right. And so you're going to hear more about it. This is like cyclical these things happen over and over and over again so if you're a student of the eco uh, economic cycle then you can recognize these things but most people don't take the time to study this stuff or don't have any interest in it and because i do you know i'm telling you guys this is why it works this is how it works and this is why this is of concern so and we mentioned here that uh you know um if i said here that the rules of the games 
uh, of the game, the system evolved into a state where those rules are no longer applicable. So the rules are changing. All right. Uh, when I'm talking about the rules are changing, meaning that society itself, we're into we're entering into the fourth industrialized uh, uh, revolution here. OK, so we're talking about, you know, artificial intelligence changing the game, 4G changing the game, uh, autonomous vehicles. All this stuff is changing the game. It's already coming. We've written articles on this stuff already. This stuff everybody knows is coming except for you if you're not paying attention. <laughs> so you can either be a victim of what is coming or you can leverage the information that I'm giving you, which I'm giving you the information for free so that you can leverage it and you can prepare uh, for those things so that you won't be a victim. But there's going to be lots of casualties in these things because they disrupt, you know, life as we know it. OK, um, but we'll get into some more of that later. Let me continue a little more. And thank you, Terry, for checking it out, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, you guys definitely uh, share your comments and remarks. I want to hear your um, your feedback, because, again, you're looking at a potential recession within the next two years. And this is going to be a very important topic. You're going to you guys are going to be hearing about it in this political cycle right now, actually. So uh, you guys chime in. There's no right or wrong answers. What's up, Terry? What's up, Tim? What's up, Demetrio? Enrique, Zach, Michelle. I see you guys. Nakina, um, if I haven't already announced you, I'll see you. I'll get to you later. But anyhow, I put in here that uh, to solve for the future, we have to first review the past. The Great Recession of 2008 took a huge blow on America's middle class. Lots of homes and jobs were lost. Uh, pushing the middle class families further into poverty. The top percenters were unaffected. In fact, the top percenters acquired many more assets after the middle class was pummeled, much like the game of Monopoly. Furthermore, the Fed pushed the interest rates down, started printing money and buying assets to jumpstart the economy. This allowed the assets that the rich acquired in the recession to appreciate exponentially, causing the wealth gap to widen even further. Now, I told you guys before in the other in the previous paragraphs, about me and my daughter playing Monopoly and why you guys should play Monopoly so that you can learn how these cycles work. What's up, Latifah? When you guys play Monopoly, you will see when you're playing a game, you'll see how it feels and you'll start to see what's going on. You'll understand how having yeah. how hoarding assets will actually keep you at the top. It's assets. OK. And it's because we also have a debt cycle. And with the debt cycle, we have the feds and the feds. They manipulate the economy. OK. Um, with their tools. And it's it's a it's a complicated scenario. And the feds are aware of this. They know that they create the wealth gaps, but they their goals and their metrics is kind of it's kind of weird. They don't uh, they don't have like goals for the bubbles. Right. <laughs> they have inflation goals. They have inflation and interest. That's their goals. And they're trying to I guess they're supposed to be trying to figure out a fix for it. But I don't think that they can. OK, so the feds are the ones who actually causes you know, these things to, to, to go up. So if you look at the stock market and again, you know, I showed you guys um, and you'll see it here in the next paragraph. If you see the expansion of the stock market from um, 2008 and you see how those in, uh, interest rates work. In fact, let me just I can just pull it up for you real quick, just so you can see what I'm talking about. I'm a very visual person, so I like to I like reading charts. That's probably why the stock market really interests me because of uh, I'm very visual. But let me uh, take you guys on a journey here. Let's go weekly chart. No, in fact, let's go monthly. We can go back 20 years. All right. So so you can guys can see what I'm talking about here. OK. All right. So if you go back 20 years. All right. And this is the recession of 2008. That's the great recession. OK. So think this is the top of the market. All right. If you have stocks, your stocks appreciated here. OK. And then they sold off down here. All right. This is where we are today. OK. If you take a look at from here to here is where we blew out the previous highs from before the recession. Now we're stacking on top of stacking on top of stacking. OK. So just think about it. When the when the, 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 the bubble bursts, everybody middle class again, people losing their houses, losing their, their hats, people jumping off buildings, what have you. All of this, those assets got down here and the people that's at the top who got the most assets, they weren't in this crowd with you. Right. <laughs> they still had cash waiting for opportunity, like uh, Warren Buffett always say, you know, uh, uh, when they're uh, he talks about when they're uh, when they're scared, you buy. Right. And when they are too optimistic, you sell. Right. And so, again, everybody's scared, selling out the bricks. The top has capital. OK, to acquire, 
to buy more at these bottoms and so they bought as much as they could all these buy points buy buy okay and hold on to these things because the feds start to lower interest rates when they lower the interest rates people can borrow more money people can buy more things people push prices up and then you see the assets start to appreciate so they're building more wealth this is the reason for the wealth gap okay <laughs> those assets have appreciated over 300 percent okay so you got stocks and real estates there's other assets too but the main ones are stocks and real estates and again this is coming from data that I did research on from the feds themselves okay if you guys cl click on these links in the article you can actually go there if you want to be a nerd you can see the, the data okay all right so next paragraph the S&P 500 has riven, risen over 340 percent since its recovery over the past 10 years and real estate is more expensive than ever shareholders have profited greatly which is why it has become my mission to educate those the everyday person on how to generate income and build wealth with the stock market for you guys that already know my story you know that's why we started wall street jack boys so that you don't be a victim of the next recession or whatever happens with the economy you want to be a master of money most people are messed up in this world with money because you don't understand money and so i said it my mission to become a master of money all right and so if you want to be a master of money so that you can no longer be a victim I ask you to join us at WallStreetJapBoys.com. Okay. Anyhow, so the next uh, the next uh, paragraph <clears throat> says, in a free <clears throat> enterprise capitalist society, it's not a problem for people to get rich. In fact, that is to be encouraged. The problem is when the middle class wages stagnate or fall, they then become victim of the debt cycle and slip into the poverty zones. When the majority can't get a piece, that is an indication that the system lo no longer works and that is the grave danger ahead. How do we get there, you say? Here's how. When a system has glitches and everyone exploits that glitch, it creates imbalances that can destroy the system if not addressed. The main culprits are globalization, technology, <clears throat> short-term shareholder profit driving corporate culture, which we're talking about corporate culture, and feds, fed monetary policy. These are the reasons why you have these glitches is because all of these different things okay so we have globalization technology corporate culture and feds ceos now the ceos are at the mercy of shareholders and are too afraid to take a portion of the 91 percent profits they pay to shareholders to pay higher living wages to their employees paying employees an increased wage will bring long-term value but corporations are obsessed with short-term gains when incomes are not enough to fight off inflation and debt then workers get disgruntled they leave or they revolt this is a potential danger here that i'm talking about okay and if i tell you this it doesn't matter i don't care what your political affiliation is i just want you to join the conversation okay but when i look at this and anybody look at this most of you don't know. Most of you guys just, you know, work, you go punch your clocks and you just want to earn your paycheck or what have you. You try to move up the corporate ladder or what have you. But at the top, everything comes from the top. It comes from the top, the CEOs and the shareholders. OK. And in the stock market, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at, you know, the shareholders. Basically, we're looking at companies ability to return profit to shareholders. Every company's goal is to return profits to shareholders. That's the whole name of the game. So CEOs are in a tight place. Because you may have some that, that, that have good intentions, but because they're at the mercy of shareholders, meaning that they have to generate revenue, generate profit uh, for shareholders. If not, then they're going to get, you know, fired. OK, so that's why we put in there uh, the mercy of shareholders. But that's a part of the culture. That's a part of the system. And it's because we have an earnings uh, showdown, which is like a freaking uh, NBA finals four times a year in the stock market. OK, every quarter. There's a showdown. Every company has to report to the SEC. Everybody in the stock market world, that's what we're looking at. That's what we're trading, right? Um, we're trading based off of, hey, are they doing good or are they doing bad? Are they making more money or are they not, right? That type of stuff. And so anyhow, when companies make more money, they don't pay it back to the employees. Uh, they, have, they basically give it back to shareholders. So that means if you were the top 10% and you have money to acquire stocks, you own stocks, you own an asset, just like real estate, right? Then um, you actually earn, you know, uh, capital, basically. Your, you know, your stocks and everything's appreciating. You're making money. But 91% of the money that corporations make goes to shareholders, okay? And what we're saying is that you know, is it necessary that 91%, you know what I mean? Can you not 
break a piece of that to the people that's actually driving the revenue, the people that's working hard every day, right? Um, and, and, and you know, um, inflation is eating their wallet every day. You know, gas prices are super high. Food is going up. You got tariff wars right now. This is why we're talking about it now, because all these things are going to come back to you. When Trump and them talking about tariffs on these countries, this, that, and the third, they're not paying it. You're paying it. You and I, we're paying it. When you go to the store, and you want to get your little avocados, it's going to cost you more money now, right? Uh, whatever material that you have, it's going to cost you more money. If you're in business, you got to go buy material, raw materials, it's going to cost you more money, right? And so your money, inflation starts to eat your money. So your money don't go long. The guys at the top, again, these guys, they're un virtually unaffected, okay? So, you know, I think that, you know, we have imbalances in the system here. And that's something that I think that's a concern that, you know, um, that needs to be addressed, okay? Um, anyhow, so next paragraph says, this culture of return more and more profits to shareholders as CEO by the balls, they strive to figure out faster ways to generate profits by firing U.S. employees, shutting down U.S. operations, and shipping them overseas for cheaper operation costs. Corporations can deliver cheaper products to U.S. consumers at the sacrifice of U.S. jobs. This is is globalization. So this globalization is what led Donald Trump to become the 45th president of the U.S. So it's a complicated situation. It's not just a, you know, one uh, one element that that's causing this. It's a lot of places we've been to some economic depressed places like upstate New York, uh, Pennsylvania. You know, uh, a lot of these places used to be pumping with jobs and those jobs are gone. I'm talking about warehouses all over the place where, you know, people, if you get laid off, you had no problem finding the job. Now they don't have options. It's like you don't have no options. You got like one or two companies. You have about one or two companies and that's it. And it's like once you go through those, you know, where do you go? Like you got to move to a whole new territory. And so a lot of people was upset about that. Now, why does that happen? It's because a lot of things is the, the, the cause of it. But for one of the reasons, the globalization, um, you can take U.S. companies can go to different countries and they can actually produce the same goods for much less you know, uh, expense on the company. So one way you grow revenue is by uh, by, you know, selling more or cutting expenses. <clears throat> so when it's hard for you to grow the sales, right, when you already, you know, reach maximum peak, you know, with your sales, then you have to look at cutting. How can we cut so that the revenue grows? The shareholders are going to be happy. CEOs get to keep their spots. Right. And so they cut uh, jobs by basically, you know, take it to Mexico, take it to China, take it wherever you're going to go, pay the workers $2 an hour, whatever the case may be, instead of having to pay you guys $15 an hour, right? And we get the goods made. And that's what, you know, this is what causes the, the imbalances when um, the race, the corporate culture changes. And we'll talk about a little more in here and I'll get into it, but it's basically once one company in that same industry is doing that and they start to have a competitive edge, and other companies see that, then they say, hey, we got to make a move because we're competing. So we need to shut down operations and, and go online. Let's go on the Internet or let's go to China. Let's go to India, wherever. And, and then it starts to create like an epidemic. So a lot of jobs get lost and people get disgruntled and then people have an issue with the system. And then you see, you know, again, hence Trump becoming the 45th president. OK, so anyhow, technology is also disrupting massive jobs. When one tribe has guns and the rest have spears, the race to get more guns become the driving force of survival or death is imminent. Artificial intelligence is the new gun of this fourth industrial revolution. Corporations can bring more profits to shareholders by deploying artificial intelligence, which allows them to cut human labor and be more efficient. Now, I've actually written some artificial intelligence. So uh, this stuff is actually kind of creepy to me because it is... It's kind of unreal. OK, you hear people like Elon Musk ringing the bell trying to tell you, hey, y'all are waking up a demon. I've actually written uh, programs, artificial intelligence, and it's based off the human brain, the neural paths of the brain to figure out how to turn this stuff into algebra expressions. OK, and um, reward it. And basically what it does is that it learns. OK, artificial intelligence are programs that, you know, coders write and they reward it to figure out issues and problems and things like that. And it figures it out. OK. It figures out whatever you're trying to set it to do. It gets its rewards, whether we feed it a zero, feed it a one, whatever it is, is the reward it knows. And it also knows failure. And so it continues to loop around situations until it figures it out. And anyhow, <clears throat> I wrote some uh, artificial intelligence that can recognize dogs and cats and pictures. And, um, you know, once we set it to task, it actually, uh, we fed it about 10,000 pictures. 
you need lots of data, uh, 10,000 pictures, and it failed. I watched it learn. I watched it learn and grow. I watched artificial, artificial intelligence fail. It has a fail percent rate and a win percent rate, and it's going through loop and trying to figure out cats from dogs. And it runs the course. It ran the course maybe in about, we'll say, three to five minutes. I can't really remember, but, but between three to five minutes, it went through 10,000 pictures, and I had a 98.9% .9 accuracy rate on my model that I built. And so when you take a look at things like artificial intelligence can hit levels 99 percent accuracy. I mean, don't make no mistakes. And it learned this stuff in like 10 minutes. OK, <clears throat> when you are up against something like that, there's no way that humans can compete. Not at all. There's no way that you can compete. Even um, in our studies, it was talking about um, um, what do you call those guys, the uh, optometrists that, that fix the eyes, uh, eye surgery guy, doctors. They have AI that actually performs the surgery as well. They're talking about the success rate of the very best eye doctors is maybe like 37 percent. So that means only 37 percent are they accurate with fixing on your eyes. There can be casualties that happen from that. And there's more casualties than there are success cases. 37 percent was crazy. But the artificial intelligence was at like 80 something percent. And so you think about it as a consumer, the guy with the shaky hands who's getting old. You see what I'm saying? So it's a, it's it's a complicated situation that drives these forces. But artificial intelligence is going to present some benefits to society. But at the same time, on the counter side, it's going to cost lots of jobs. OK. And the I.T. sector, they're already aware of this. They already have people that's already working on plans because they know it has coming. They're just slowly bringing it in because they don't want to create, you know, fear in the in the market. They don't want people to be scared. They already know that it has to happen because that's the way our markets are driven is to be faster, leaner, more efficient. And artificial intelligence allow that. It's much more faster. Stuff is perfect almost. Um, doesn't really make uh, mistakes. And if it does, it's just so small. Um, you can look at the uh, Department of Transportation talking about autonomous vehicles, how they had to get human drivers off the road because we are the reasons why people are dying on the roads. You know, we're on our cell phones, we're drinking, we're all this stuff. And the artificial intelligence is like, phew, they just, you know, they already got it. The stuff is already here. It's just getting through the bureaucracy. And the, the goal is to get humans off the road to create safer, you know, safer uh, driving experience and you know, so they won't lose, you know, that many lives, but that's going to put people out of work at the same time. So you get people to displace. So anyway, it's the pros and cons to all of this stuff. So you got to see every angle. Anyhow, you can see how companies will exploit this so that they can be more efficient. So if you're doing a job that's repetitive, it don't matter. If it's a repetitive job, it's going to be gone. You know, within the next 10, 15 years, the job is going to be gone. The AI can actually learn it. It's probably already got it. They don't want to create scarcity. So they actually just, you know, slowly easing it in. One day you're going to be driving and there's going to be a car next to you without a human driver in there. And that's going to be your cue. You're like, yo, I remember that crazy guy on Facebook was telling me about this. This is happening in real life now. I'm like, yeah, they're going to start showing you more movies. They're going to start showing you so you can get comfortable with it. You know, they're going to do trainings at your job. So they're going to let you know, hey, you need to get comfortable with this so that once they start to bring it in and, and before it goes full all, all, you know, assault, you guys are comfortable with it. You know, in Japan, they already got robots working next to humans and they got names and everything these robots are built off of ai i mean they can move just like humans and everything but they don't get pregnant they don't get sick they don't <laughs> have funerals to go to they don't need time off they don't ask for raises you know it's just you know you know the corporate the corporate world is going to demand that it replaces you that's just eventually what has to happen but anyhow uh the next uh sentence here says that uh, next paragraph says tax policy is one of the main factors that is allowing blockbuster corporate earnings instead of reinvesting those savings into the workers the corporations are paying record-breaking salaries to ceos and record-breaking share buy buybacks to increase the bottom line of shareholders ceos are making over 300 times more than the average employee while bouncing from firm to firm their tenure is short-lived before they move to the next company to rinse and repeat so again, I think I just wanted to highlight, you know, the fact that those people that's at the top, that's immune to, you know, the situations, you know, that us at the bottom have to go through when there's a recession and things like that, because they have enough capital to acquire assets. Right. And they have lots of assets. Again, when CEOs are making over 300 times more than the average employee, not the bottom. We are talking about average over 300 times. And again, you can click on this link. Okay. Again, I put all the resources in here. Not all of it, but I did get put some resources in here so you guys can follow up. Lots of research goes into this stuff. But is it necessary that they make over 300 times? You know, is it necessary that CEO, uh, the companies buy back all these shares of stocks? And again, who does that benefit? Shareholders. 
shareholders, CEOs, these guys get compensated with stocks. Okay. So the top, Again, when there's an economic downturn, these guys are going to be good. You know, again, they bounce from different companies. They say, oh, we're going to change this company. And think about it. Maybe the company you work for, uh, how long has the CEO been at the company you work at or the VPs or the presidents? These guys, they switch or it's like a, the elite class. They go from company to company doing the same thing, making broken promises, whatever they're doing, celebrate. And then next thing you know, they go to the next company. It's like once you get into that realm, you kind of, you know, protect it pretty much because you can go be a VP or some kind of senior management at any other company once you get into that realm. But it's, you know, it's difficult coming from the bottom to get to that, to that top, to that top. And again, these are the spectacles. Again, you have the spectacles because that's what people will say. I want to be the CEO. So that creates the drive in people say, Hey, I can do it because it's an opportunity. It doesn't mean that it's going to be like, you know, uh, a strong probability, but it's there because it, it exists. People will strive to get there. So that creates productivity. Anyhow, uh, lastly, after the recession, the Fed monetary policy has artificially boosted asset prices that are mainly owned and controlled by the top percenters. When you look at the whole wealth inequality argument from a wider view, you can easily see that we need to resolve the system flaw so that it works for the majority. We just explained that to you guys. I just showed you guys the stock market and I just showed you all of that. And then next paragraph is what can you do to fend off this gloomy outcome? I'm glad you asked. Low skilled jobs are at risk of being cut by artificial intelligence and globalization. If you want to stay in the game and enhance your income, then you will have to shift your focus to learning high paying skills. From there, you can start a business or get a high gross career that will earn you enough money to acquire assets like stocks and real estate to build generational wealth. This means that education is the biggest controllable variable that can change your life. This sentence, I love this sentence because it's true. All the corporations are complaining right now over this thing here. It's called skills, right? Think about the highest paying job. You can click on this link here. This will take you to the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics and you can see all the high paying jobs. I have my kids look at this, okay? Because that's what your guidance counselors will be showing you, you know? Uh, what jobs are going to be in demand in the next five years and how much are they paying and things like that. I think a lot of people probably would have went to school for something different <laughs> instead of going to school for liberal arts stuff. You know what I mean? Like stuff not paying no money. OK. And then you got massive amounts of debt and you can't pay it off. There was just an article that just went out. Uh, I believe it was yesterday uh, talking about um, people are fleeing America to avoid paying off their student loan debts. I was like, man, that's a way to run off on the plug. <laughs> Just leave the country, right? <laughs> but it's crazy because, you know, people are going to college and it's crazy when people be trying to boast, oh, I got this degree and this degree. Please don't ever do that, okay? Just, you know, just be humble, okay? With your degrees, I mean, that's fancy and all, but it doesn't mean anything, okay? Uh, if you can get you a high paying uh, job or career or you can start a business with it, then that's good. Maximize on that. That's how you leverage that. People that are working jobs that are low skills, meaning I told you earlier, if it's repetitive, it's going to be replaced. OK, do not get comfortable where you are. You have to be a student of life. OK, even myself, I have a course. Our course we teach at WallStreetJackBoys.com, where I'm trying to teach everybody, teaching you guys, just every ordinary person uh, to be able to you know, make money in the stock market. You don't need a college degree or nothing like that. But even as a teacher, I'm also a student. I stay learning. I have so many certifications and licenses. It's amazing, right? And I'm going to always continue to learn because the world is constantly evolving. And if you fail to evolve, then you will die. So don't get comfortable with your job, living it up. That's fine. Have fun. But <clears throat> you need to get into a high paying skill career, okay? Or get some kind of high paying skills. All right. So you can click on this link right here. And that's a list of those careers is there. Uh, I encourage everybody to learn from some, somewhere. OK, just keep learning. All right. Um, that's the key. And that's the thing that you can control. You can't control the, the market environment. You can't control interest rates. You can't control Donald Trump. You can't control none of that stuff. OK, uh, but what you can control is uh, your ability and to to uh, create opportunity for yourself. OK. And if I'm telling you that there's opportunities, corporations are telling you that there's opportunities. And this is the thing. The corporations have the opportunities and they are upset about it because they don't want to spend all this money on paying high salaries. They need for the top paying salaries to be competitive so they could drive the prices down. Right. So they can drive the wages down. Right now, these guys are paying data scientists, doctors, all these people are, you know, paying 
astronomical amounts of of, of money. I had a client who said he makes four hundred thousand dollars a year uh, doing um, uh, data science work. I got another uh, client that's making over two hundred thousand dollars a year uh, uh, doing data analytics type work. Right. Uh, these guys are working in the computer fields. This is where you normally see Asians and foreigners working in these fields. These guys already know the blueprint before they come to this country. Like they're not coming over here flipping burgers. Are you crazy? This is this is the the land where you can actually drive a Ferrari if you want to and live in a mansion. And so that opportunity exists. What do you have to do to get to that opportunity? You have to learn high paying skills. So it means you need to shift your mind to a learning mind. Forget all the partying, forget all the spending, forget all the flossing, forget all the showing off on Instagram, get to learning, get to developing new skills, because in return for your skill set, you will be paid, you will be compensated for, you know, for your skill sets. And whether it's you work for somebody else or you start a business with the skills that you learn, like that's another uh, key part of building wealth is having your own business. Business is an asset as well. Right. So anyhow, I just encourage you guys uh, to do that. And I also went further in to tell you that the traditional four year degree is no longer necessary to learn high paying skills. Thanks to the Internet. That's changing. I was talking about uh, enrollments uh, are going down. Actually, that's something that's in the news right now. So I said, for example, Wall Street Jack boys, you click on a link, you go to my website and you can learn how to trade and make money in the stock market. Uh, Wall Street Jack boys, we specialize in a down to earth, clear path approach to learning how to make money in the stock market at WallStreetJackBoys.com. Great online courses can be found in places such as Udacity and Coursera. And no, this is not a sponsored post. I'm not getting paid for this, okay? I'm just telling you this is probably where you need to go. A simple Google search is a great place to start to get started on building the skills needed to close the gap. There's so much research that goes into the wealth inequality argument that I encourage you all to learn more. This will be a core topic during this election cycle. Make sure that you add your voice and engage in the discussion. Happy trading Wall Street, Jack boys and girls, as we always close it that way in our um, in our blog sessions here. So, again, you know, you guys, make sure you hit that share button, uh, pass this information along to someone who could benefit from it. Uh, even yourself, you know, keep it as a point of reference so that you guys can, you know, know what's going on in the markets and, you know, uh, capitalize and leverage the information that you're getting. So with that being said, I'm going to open the floor one more time. Any questions? Uh, small Q and A here. If you guys got any questions about anything that's in the article, um, you know, if you have a debate, if you have an opposing point of view, all questions are welcome. All points of views are welcome. Okay. Did you guys have any questions on the Facebook side? Anybody have any questions? What's good, Rob? OG, I see you in the building. What's good, Jeff? What's good, Charles? What's good, Latifa? All right, I see you guys. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, this is this is a really good situation here. Uh, it's a good situation, and you know that's why I love my platform because I, I did this because I want to be able to impact the lives of the many. Um, I want to be able to multiply my effectiveness on as many as people as possible, and that's not limited to race, color, gender, you know, religion. You know, if you have a brain that can you know can learn and willing to learn, then we want you. You know, I can put a hundred and ten percent effort behind people who put a, at least 100 percent effort behind yourself. OK, so. But yeah. All right. So it's been a long day here. I'm going to go ahead and close the session off. I appreciate everybody for stopping by. Make sure you guys, uh, you know, get those thumbs ups, share this post, uh, share the post, sign up for the courses if you already haven't. Uh, sign up for somebody's courses if you don't have the, the skills. But uh, we definitely will welcome you here. Anyhow, I'm getting ready to close the session. You guys have a wonderful night. Peace.